My name is Scott King. I am the president elect for the Nebraska Association of Teachers of Science. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce today Oki Lee. Um, we'll be having a conversation to you about convergences and divergences across content areas as part of our 2020 virtual conference in science education. Uh, this is, of course, a conference that we just kind of created um, just a couple weeks ago as we uh, looked at the different time that we are in right now. Um, we just have a couple of quick housekeeping things before I turn it over to um, Oki. First of all, in the uh, underneath your picture, you should have three little dots that you can rename yourself so that it says, you know, Scott King, Nebraska, 9 through 12. And what this does is it helps um, our speakers know where you're coming from, um, both in the country, uh, internationally, or um, what grade level you're coming from so that they can tailor questions and answers specifically to you. Uh, please do leave your microphones muted unless you're asking a question. And I know that um, Oki is wanting to have some Q&A sessions throughout, so feel free to unmute at those point in times. Uh, we love seeing your smiling faces. And if you are having some bandwidth issues, please go ahead and turn off your own camera. That'll help save on your bandwidth and maybe make it a little bit easier for you guys to pay attention and hear what's going on. Some norms. First of all, you are here voluntarily for the good of your students, and this is a fantastic and wonderful thing, and we are applauding that. And everybody else here is for that same reason. Everyone's ideas are important and valid to us today. Uh, please share your information, knowledge, and expertise in our chat. Um, any notes that um, may be happening, or again, with unmuting yourself and with your voice. Please ex exhibit professional behavior and be like a proton and stay positive. And with that, I am going to stop my share and let it turn over to Oki. Oki, thank you very much for being here. And you're still, there you go. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, everybody. I hope that you are all, when, when I learned English, it was a hello and goodbye. But these days, I hope that you are well and that we end every greeting with a stay safe and healthy. So I'm going to start with, I hope that everybody is doing well. It's an honor to be here today. Um, I hope that while you are dealing with the very difficult circumstances, I also say that it is important that we keep some normalcy and keep living. So it's in that context that we are here today. Um, I am in New York City, so I'm getting a lot of the emails from people saying, are you okay, are you okay? So, and I'm okay here. So we are going to dive into the topic that I would like to share with you today. Um, these ideas are not necessarily well formulated, so I'm going to throw some ideas at you so that you can think about, hmm, what do we do? And what should we do? And then I'm also going to relate to post-pandemic of what will happen. So those are the ideas. I have asked Scott to have this session for about an hour and 30 minutes. So I hope that you indulge in some lengthy uh, meeting. You can leave any time. But there will be some uh, about the three times that I'm going to ask you for questions and answers. So get ready. And here we go. And we are going to the future today, uh, beyond the science. Nebraska Association, and it's a really an, my honor to come back to Nebraska since my visit last year. So I'll be talking about the convergences and divergences across content areas, or you could call it as a cross-curricular connections and disconnections which we will find out. Um, topics, I would like to share three topics. One is framing of the issue. Why does this issue matter? So I'm here to convert you to say, wow, that really is an important topic that we need to think about. The second is that 
possible approaches to addressing convergences and discrepancies across content areas. And I would like to propose two possible approaches to address how the content areas converge and diverge. And I'm sure that you have your own ideas that you would like to share with, with, the, with the group. And the third topic that I'm asking you to be part of the participants is that based on each approach, meaning that each of the two approaches, what questions do you have for your own teaching and what ideas do you would like to share with other participants during the webinar? The first topic, framing the issue. So why does the issue matter? Why does it matter? Now, currently, emerging forces in STEM including or in computer science education are changing rapidly due to three emerging forces. One is that student demographics are changing rapidly. Another force is that new standards in STEM and computer science subjects are academically rigorous. And still another emerging force is that technological innovations are advancing fast. Now, if you put those emerging forces in the present, you may be thinking, what do all these mean after the pandemic? We are all doing some form of remote instruction, online instruction, some sort of a digital. And you can imagine that some students are on online and others are trying to meet daily needs. And any technological innovations inherently have the danger of a widening the gap between haves and have-nots. So I was thinking about these topics and it seems that what we thought of the future is exponentially accelerating and it's almost like a thrust upon us in the present with a very little preparation. So all these topics are not only the present but also in the immediate future. So I would like to pose that question to you. Now, so STEM and science, computer science education for all these are the three emerging forces of a broadening participation of a diverse student groups, STEM and computer science disciplines, and technological innovations of, of, uh, of robots and artificial intelligence and virtual reality and uh, scratch and all those things are happening. And then they are converging because students are learning STEM and science, computer science using technological devices and they all happening at the same time. It's not one or the other, they all three. Why do these three domains matter? Because these are the lives of your lives when you teach and these are the lives of the students. So students are doing, all students are doing STEM, including computer science, using some sort of a technological devices. When I look at this picture, it is a technological devices with the teacher and students. This time, the teacher is not there. It's the remote instruction, which is moving so fast currently. Now, we can think of an example of how these three focal areas across the three domains may look like. So in my own research, broadening participation, we focus on we, meaning that my team, focuses on English learners, we focus on science, and then we are moving into computational thinking using computational devices. And then it is a convergence of these three areas. I would like to entertain you a little bit about, now we are talking about the classrooms with the students. What about the National Science Foundation that is at the frontier of innovations, discoveries, and frontiers? What do they do? I would like to just put what the students are doing and what teachers are doing with regard to the science Fund, National Science Foundation. This is really for adult conversation. 
National Science Foundation has a, something called the NSF 10 Big Ideas. These are 10 big ideas are related to what NSF considers of the future by 2026. So here's NSF 10 Big Ideas. Here is a striking image of the way NSF thinks of 10 Big Ideas. Do you see that? It's a brain with the gears. It's like machine learning. You can imagine artificial intelligence. That's the way NSF thinks of the future when they propose 10 big ideas. It's a human and machines or technology. So I would like to present the 10 big ideas at NSF. I know it's very busy, so I would like to go one at a time. There are 10 of them. The first one is called the Harnessing the Data Revolution. It is data science, computer science, and computational thinking. That's a one big idea. Another big idea that NSF proposes for the future is a human technology interactions where humans and technology intersect at work. They don't get into the human personal lives. So one, data science, computer science, human technology interactions, those are two. Now there is one more here, growing conversion research at NSF. So NSF thinks of that when the probe goes to Saturn, it is not just uh, Mars, it's not just the science, it's a science, engineering, computer science, biology, all together of a converging disciplines to make that happen. There is another big idea called the INCLUSE, the very clever, but what it means is that it's a diversity and inclusion of all students. So you cover one, two, three, four, about data science, computer science, computational thinking, human and technology interactions through the convergent research by including all students of a diversity and inclusion. Now, just for your information about what about the other remaining eight? Let me say that this one is Earth science navigating the new Arctic. I think of it as uh, trying to find the origin of the planet Earth. Here is astrophysics. It's a new window into the universe and it's a finding the origin of the universe. And here is quantum revolution. So here is the origin of a matter. And here is a phenotype. It's about the origin of a life. So that's what NSF is trying to do, the origins of life, matter, universe, and the planet Earth. And then this is, a, so these are 10 big ideas at NSF. Now, how do they overlap with the education in K through 12 settings? You can think of harnessing the data as a data science, a computer science, and computational thinking. These are the disciplines. You can think of a future of work at a human technology frontiers as a technological innovation that are pushing the STEM. You can think of a growing convergent research at NSF as a converging teaching and learning. I find this very interesting that just like the sending a probe to Mars requires a convergence of multiple disciplines, in K through 12 classrooms, our students are looking at the convergence of all different subject areas by looking at how math, science, English language arts, and social studies all converge or sometimes diverge. And then the last is that it's all students. It's a broadening participation of all students. So you can see that NSF 10 Big Ideas are very much related to STEM education and that's the lives of the students. So I make the case of how the scientific and scientific frontiers are very much the realities of the students in K through 12 classrooms. So here is, is a set of questions that I would like to ask you to think about. The reality of these emerging forces in the lives of students and teachers that compels the education community to figure out how these forces intersect across, among, between the disciplines or the domains or subject areas. So what does this mean for your teaching? How do convergences 
offer affordances and discrepancies or present tensions and challenges in your teaching. And collectively as the education community, how do we capitalize on the affordances that these subject areas converge? But how also we productively address tensions because of the discrepancies across the different subject areas. So here is a question mark. And I would like to ask you to take one minute to jot down your thoughts in the chat box. I'm not going to ask you to share it yet, but just take one minute to jot down. Hmm. What do these emerging forces of broadening participation of all students, learning STEM subjects, including computer science and data science, using technological devices or technological innovations? So one minute, please. Okay, thank you for taking the moment to put down your thoughts. I have asked the board member or members to, to continue to check the chat box and then get some questions along the way, but we'll have a couple of times where we have a pause and do the Q&A. So I am going to continue and I hope that I have intrigued your thoughts and brain of, hmm, what do we do about the emerging forces intersecting? So I'm going to continue to the next topic, which is what are the possible approaches to addressing convergences and discrepancies across the content areas? And I would like to propose two possible approaches. And I'm sure that you are thinking of other approaches that you can think of connecting them the cross-curricular connections. The two possible approaches that I can think of. Approach one, identifying disciplinary practices that cut across the content areas. Disciplinary practices mean, meaning that in science and engineering practices, like ask questions, um, develop models, construct explanations, argue from evidence. Those are the disciplinary practices in science and engineering. And I would like to see how those intersect in science and engineering with other subject areas. Um, now, content areas highlight the discrete practices consistently that I will share in the next couple of slides, which is an advancement over traditional silos. Traditionally, we thought that I'm teaching science and I don't know about math. I'm teaching ELA and I don't worry about science. So we all did a silos. This time we are looking at practices across. So there is a practice of argue from evidence and argue from evidence from math and argue from evidence possibly from social studies. When these disciplines come together, both the convergences and discrepancies emerge. We are very excited about the convergences and we also say, whoops, there are gaps. Currently, we do not know the extent of how much the disciplines or subject areas converge and how much subject areas are discrepant. And furthermore, when we think of asking questions, argue from evidence, these are all very language intensive. And by being language intensive, 
These are for all students, but especially English learners, students with a limited literacy, students with a language difficulty, the students with a special needs. So these language intensive and nature of a discipline practice is applied to many students. Right. So here are the and assuming and expecting that many of the people on the Zoom are science and engineering teachers, I would like to go over the ELA and literacy common core practices. So ELA says that in addition to students reading and learning about reading and writing and speaking, listening and language, ELA also has a student to demonstrate independence, students to build a strong content knowledge, students to respond to the varying demands of audience, the task, purpose and discipline. Students are comprehend as well as a critique. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Students value evidence. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Students use a technology and digital media. Hmm, that seems like okay, students understand the perspectives, the cultures, the science and engineering don't think as much about the deeds. So these are the ELA practices according to Common Core. What about the mathematics? Again, I would like to take a moment to, to look at mathematical practices because I just expect that many of the people are science teachers. So according to Common Core, mathematical practice, numbers and geometry, mathematical practices also include making sense of a phenomenon problems and persevere in solving them. Reason abstractly and quantitatively. Construct the viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. And you say, that sounds familiar. Model with the mathematics and you say, that sounds familiar. Use appropriate tools strategically. Um, yeah, we use the tools in science. Attend to precision could it be measurement? Look for and make use of a structure, and that reminds me of a structure and function. Look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. Ah, regularity sounds a little bit patterns. So as you are going through mathematical practices, you may be thinking of uh, hmm, science practices or even cross-cutting concepts. Now we are going to science. And for the benefit of those, I hope, but who are not teaching science. So in science and engineering practice, in addition to cross-cutting concepts and core ideas, we have asked questions and define problems, that develop and use the models, plan and carry out investigations, analyze and interpret data, use the mathematics and computational thinking. Oh, technology. Construct explanations and design solutions, engage in argument from evidence, and obtain, evaluate, communicate information. So those are the practices. Now, these are practices across ELA and math and science have been really admired by many. Now, in addition to the ELA, math and science, we also have ELP, English language proficiency standards. These are just like a science standards, ELA standards, and math standards. This is simply English language proficiency standards, the ELP standards that are particularly for English learners. These are just the standards. Now, for all of you, it is a federal mandate according to Every Student Succeeds Act of 2017. It says, each state the plan shall demonstrate that the state has adopted English language proficiency standards that are derived from the four recognized domains of speaking, listening, and reading, writing. As a science person, I have to critique, and I hope you will critique too. When you look at the ELP standards, it says only about the linguistic modality. It doesn't say anything about non-linguistic modalities or diagrams charts and graphs because the ELA Common Core have only speaking, listening, reading, and writing and conventions of language, which is limited that when it is applied to other content areas. The second is to address the different proficiency levels of English learners that I will say a little bit later. What is really important for content areas is that ELP, English language proficiency standards, are aligned with challenging state academic standards. So it is by federal mandate that English language proficiency standards for English learners should be aligned with content standards. 
it applies to students with a limit uh, the, the, the special education. Now, what is also important for NGSS is that NGSS, their very basic premise is all standards, all students, meaning that all standards, all students, including English learners. So they go together according to the federal mandate of English language learners. Okay, keep that in mind. What is really interesting is that ELP standards are aligned with the content standards, but it doesn't say the other way around. It doesn't say content standards are aligned with the ELP standards. Okay, so ELP standards have uh, somewhat of additional uh, demands on them. Now let's continue that. So here is, you may not be familiar with this. Um, I was working with Helen Quinn, the chair of the framework document. Gualo Vivaldez, who is applied linguist. When we were looking at these disciplinary practices across ELA, math, and science, we thought about this that we published. So we, we thought a lot. And this requires a science educator, a scientist, with applied linguist, thinking about what does it mean across subject areas with a focus on English learners and students with special needs. Now, that was also related to another version of the diagram, which is colorful. And this comes from Understanding Language Initiative at Stanford University. And this is an initiative where English learner community reached out to the content areas for collaboration. So this diagram actually started from Understanding Language Initiative at Stanford, looking at the convergence of disciplines, I mean, the practice across the subject areas and how they relate to English learners. Now, the next one is something that science educators are very familiar with, and that is NSTA. So different versions have been entertained by, by English learner education, science education, and it hasn't gotten to mathematics education as much. But this is a very um, familiar diagram that we have been admiring. Especially, we have been admiring this center. So, ELA 5 has a read, write, speak ground in evidence. Mathematics has a, has a construct a viable argument critic, and also ELA 4, science 7, engage in argument from evidence. So, here is the center of the convergence. It's all about argument, argue from evidence. We love arguing. All right, so you're saying that is a beautiful. All the subject areas converge on the importance of an argument. So what do we do about it? And you say in ELA, math and science all have to take a seat at the table and we have to figure out what that convergence means. So I'm getting into that convergence and it's not as pretty as we hope to be. Now that we all agree that argument is really important, here we go. Argumentation is a key disciplinary practice across the content areas. So a couple of questions that we may ask. What counts as argument according to different norms across the content areas? So, what does argument mean in science? What does argument mean in English language arts? What does argument mean in social studies? Hmm. The second question is that when are students engaging in or expected to be able to engage in argument in science, math, or ELA? Now, science educators will say, what do you mean developmental progression? The kindergarten students should engage in argument according to the framework in the NGSS. In science, we don't really count opinion of, of, I love rainbows. That doesn't quite belong. 
So that's what science teachers may say. Now you may also say that once we define what is argument across the content areas, what do we expect that English learners across the proficiency levels, do they all engage in argument? So these are the three questions. I hope that I'm wetting your appetite of, huh, what am I going to say to my colleagues in ELA math when I teach science? Do they say the same thing about argument in ELA? Do they say the same thing about that, that all students are engaging in argument in ELA? Do they say the same thing about the English learners at beginning level, intermediate level, or advanced level? So those are the three questions. And I wrote about it, and it's uh, so. Discipline practices across the content areas, and you can see that I'm smiling with the expectation of you smiling as you, we continue the session. Discipline practices across content areas are using argument as an example of the convergence. My motivation started several years ago that I attended a conference at a state, it was an NGSS state conference with uh, about a hundred leaders that included uh, chief academic officers, supervisors, teachers, um, district, state, all together to, when the NGSS took off. And to demonstrate what NGSS instruction would look like, a second grade teacher presented her unit on the, the properties, the structure and properties of a matter at the second grade. The second grade is about the properties of matter and it's about solid and liquid and those were the topics. And it was a, a wonderful presentation, very thoughtfully done. And then she was making connection to ELA and this is what she said. I asked my students, to write about that. You know, when you have a, something that is a little bit jarring, that doesn't sound quite right. And at the conference with all the leaders, no one asked any question, but it just it didn't sound right to me. So I kept thinking about why would a, such an outstanding science teacher would ask her student to, to write your opinion about the solid and liquid or structure and property matter. So after spending some time, I asked my colleague Helen Quinn and Guadalupe Valdez and a few other people saying, why do you think the second grade teacher, an outstanding teacher, asked her students to write about? And they said, okay, you are wrong. And I say, I'm not saying I say opinion in writing, science writing. I just heard that statement. And it really uh, concerned me. So that was the beginning of, and I said, hmm, write about opinion. And I started looking into common core state standards. Now, I'm not a detailed person, and I don't like a fine print, but I just had to sit down to see why would she do that? It might be that it might have something to do with a common core. So I sat down, and I combed through the common core. I also read appendices A, B, and C. Now, science standards have many, many appendices. Math, State Common Core does not have any appendix. ELA has the three appendices, so I studied all of them. And this is what I found between science and ELA Common Core, but also research literature. So these are the thoughts that emerged from my reading of the literature and the standards document about what counts as argument in, in ELA and science. And when children's ability emerge in engaging in argument, developmentally progressing. So this is not just the common core. This is actually ELA research literature. It's not just the science standards, it's a science literature. 
So when you think about what counts as argument, as a norms, and when children are not able to engage in argument, this is what I found across the standards and literature between the two subject areas. Common Core and Science Standards acknowledge that what counts as argument differs across the content areas, but neither offer guidance on these differences. They say argument is different across the subject areas, period. And I thought that that's not very helpful. But then what I also found was that Common Core and NGSS differ on what K through five children are able to engage in argument. One is that there are no guidelines of how they differ. But the other is that they are simply different, which are very confusing. So how? Here is a common core, Appendix A, page 20, 23, with a no research citation. There is a one paragraph. This is a part of, uh, there are different types of uh, writing. There is a narrative writing, there is uh, expository writing, there is argument writing, and argument writing is the most important because argument pre-careers in college. So here is a one paragraph. Although young children are not able to produce a fully developed logical arguments, they develop a variety of methods. These are kinds of expository structures are steps on the road to argument. In grades K through five, the term opinion is used to refer to this developing form of argument. It's not that argument and opinion are two different types of writing, no. K through five students are not able to engage in argument writing. Instead, they are doing opinion writing. Developmentally, Kathy, I see your expression and thank you. I know you're dying to say. So, I did a find and search in Common Core just to see how often opinion occurs. So it really is the case that opinion starts from grade six. I know that you may be compelled to go to Common Core State Standards and do search and find of opinion. And this is what you will find. So when we do argument, argument also has a claim, evidence, and reasoning. It's a C-E-R. Now in science, we think of uh, claim evidence reasoning as a part of argument with the various nuances and we don't say that, but when you look in common core, it is a claim evidence and reasoning as if it's like a paper and pepper and salt. It's like that, it's pepper and salt, paper, claim evidence and reasoning, claim evidence and reasoning. It is a one phrase, okay. Then when you look into Evidence is introduced for the first time and the only once in grade three. And starting from grade four, evidence is used regularly. It's a developmental progression of introduced once, and then it appears consistently at, a, at, at later grade, grade four. Claim is introduced in grade five, once, and then claim is used at grade six consistently. Reasons as a product is used in grade K through five, and then and it used consistently. The process of a reasoning starts in grade six because the reasoning as a process is a more demanding, apparently. And argument it is used from grade six. So students do opinion and start doing evidence starting from once in grade three, 
and then grade four. Come to science and engineering. And this is from the NRC document. Young students can begin by constructing an argument. They need the instructional support to go beyond simply making claims. That is to include reasons or references to evidence and to begin to distinguish evidence from opinion. So here is an example of a kindergarten constructing an argument based on evidence. So you can imagine. So this gave me a real pause. So we expect the students to do one in ELA and we expect the students to do another in science. And I do not know what we expect the students to do in math. And I don't know what we expect the students to do in social studies because we don't communicate across content areas. So the second grade teacher who asked her students to write an opinion, she did it right according to Common Core because she was linking science to Common Core at the second grade. For science educators, it actually turned out to be a problematic when Achieve did uh, the, the unit on assessment. There is one example, it says something about argument, but it will say that argument starts and science standards do not overstep. We always go based on ELA and math, we, go, we, we, we make it aligned. So there is actually one example of a unit that says that argument in ELA starts from sixth, so we don't insist on argument in K through five because that's the way ELA is done. I, I know, it's a, so that's, I was just thinking, wow, students must be really confused between ELA science and possibly math and social studies. So I, apparently I made an argument about the in discrepancies. And here is when New York State revised ELA learning standards, and now we call it next generation English language arts at PK through 12. Um, we had to do it because New York City is a too independent. Okay, I know we all went through the backlash. So that was in 17. And this is what New York State did, which I am, I take some, some pride. New York State said, please know, the students in second grade should understand the difference between opinions and arguments. They begin to know right argument. So it's not starting from sixth grade. In New York State, it is a second grade. Not fair, right? starting from second, third, fourth, and fifth. So we skip at least K and kindergarten and first grade are still doing opinion, but starting from second grade instead of starting from sixth grade. So for example, students opinion are like, but keep the evidence. So in New York State, we second grade students are making the distinction between opinion, uh, the opinion and, and argument. So I consider that it is a big step making a difference. Now I spoke about the science and the ELA. Let's go to the English learners. Think of, oh well, boy, I am slow, so I, I will move a little bit faster. Now you get the hang of it. English language proficiency standards. Here is a one, first grade, and here is a four, and here is a nine through 12, okay. Level one, level two, level three. Here is a, a, about the claim and evidence and claim and evidence, so it's about argument. Here is what happens. All right, first grade about the argument. Level one student, a student who is just learning to learn English, express an opinion, I can buy that. It's from ELA Common Core. But when you look at level five, a student who is much more proficient in English, express opinions, introduce topic. So just because a student is a proficient in English, he is a whole lot more capable of academically. So for someone like me, if I come from Korea, and if I'm a beginner, this is what I do. But my colleague who speaks English more proficiently do a whole lot more, even though I may know science quite a bit. Now here is another one, nine through 12. So it's uh, later on, and students are doing argument. Do you see that? Here's a mistake. High school students are doing the same thing as a first grader. Now. Because a student is much more proficient, it does a whole lot more. This language proficiency is the foundation for cognitive ability. 
Now, here is another example of a WIDA. By the way, WIDA is a changing very substantially, and I'm hoping that you will have a chance. So WIDA standards have something, science standards support an argument. All right, support an argument. And we say argument, it's all standards, all students. But they, they translate to language use, and it becomes a variety of informational text and media. Huh. And then it becomes analyzed. Hmm. It was a support and argument. And then level one, identify words and phrases, sort words and phrases. So level students are doing sorting, not identifying. Level students are categorizing, level four students are arguing, organizing, level four students are order. And then it's the words and phrases, the words and phrases, and then suddenly it's a sentence, it's a sentences and paragraphs. By language of proficiency, if you are level one, you are cognitively low. So we have this discrepancy. You can think of arguing from evidence is important, but ELA and science think of it differently. And English language learner education is doing differently. So you can think of it something like this. If we really come together, ELA, math, science, and social studies, we need to think about what counts as evidence in different disciplines, when students are able to engage, what is uh, what mathematics say as a discipline, what education research literature says, what content standards say, and then what would be the implication to continue. We hope that there is a much more convergence, a consistency, to make the lives of students a whole lot easier because of the consistency. But if math is different from science because the disciplines are different, then as long as we make those differences very intentional and explicit and tell students that the way we argue in science is different from the way we argue in social studies, that's fine because disciplines are different. But we have to know how they are different and make those differences very explicit for the teachers and students. So here is that. Okay, I wrote about this. Um, I would like to ask you, I know I spoke a lot, but I'll continue. I would like to ask you to think about for your teaching, what these convergencies and discrepancies that you just saw, and you're saying, wow, that's not good. What would that mean for your teaching? for your collaboration with your colleagues, for your collaboration with your school district policy. I would like to ask you to take one minute to write in your chat. And the board member, after one minute, if you can just pick about two questions, I would like to, I would like to respond to a couple of questions that you pick. Okay, thank you. And Scott or somebody, the board member, would you ask a couple of questions, please? Uh, we only have a couple up right now. I'm sure others will be populating. Yep, there they go. Um, wait, wait, uh, then 20 more seconds. All right. So looking at what I'm seeing here, um, Adeline Johnson, who's a second grade teacher, said that the units are great for, for time. However, the phonics of math 
or the phonics and math instruction is an issue because the materials for science don't easily align with ability. I guess I read that differently. I was thinking that the word choices were different and that was going to cause problems. Um, Taylor Gum from Burwell is a secondary science teacher, and I, I agree with this one. Said that um, it'll lead to many cross core interactions, but how do you get teachers interested in this? You know, I look at it from my science classroom, and I don't know how to connect in with my English teachers very well. How do we get other teachers interested in these kind of connections? Second grade teacher. Now this was secondary. This is uh, seven twelve. Ah, secondary. So you could say that uh, that the discrepancies as well as uh, convergences are much more uh, urgent at the elementary level if you are teaching multiple subject areas. But it also applies the same to secondary, not as much as. But, but they're still the same way. So secondary students, I would say that the higher the secondary students are closer to the disciplines, so they are doing more closer to the disciplines. You can think of two different ways of a convergences. One is that it could be possible, it could be possible that as a standard, the content areas that what counts as argument as ELA and math and science. So even for secondary students, it would really benefit students if we make those convergences and differences very intentional so that you can say that now in science, when we do the evidence, this is somewhat comparable to when you do evidence in social studies, but in science, we do argument somewhat differently because that's the way science is defined. And for the good of the students, as the more that we can make those differences, as well as how they converge, it will make the lives of our lives and especially the lives of students much more productive. Uh, Janine Charara, I'm sorry, I slaughtered your name, is from Michigan and she's a K-5 resource. She's talking about um, the standards, how we evaluate students, um, how do we provide guidance to teachers and districts? Oh, they moved on me. Okay, to assess student performance in a way that we test their content knowledge versus cognitive proficiency. Uh, that's uh, English learners related to, or just cognitive proficiency with the, say it again, it's got cognitive proficiency. How do we provide guidance to teachers and district to assess student performance in a way that we test their content knowledge versus cognitive proficiency? Okay, that's a great question. One thing that I always start, even with English language educators and students, teachers of a special education, is that content standards are expected of all students. We start from content standards. With English learners, we do not start from language. Traditionally, we say that Oki who does not speak English and just from another country, I give her more vocabulary, vocabulary because she doesn't have. That's a traditional. And it's the same with the students with the special needs. My student has a difficulty with the reading comprehension as so I give her more interventions on decoding and vocabulary comprehension all that. Instead, when students, all students are in science, all students are doing science standards. So when you think of that way, um, proficiency, then you start from science standards. Science standards start with making sense of a phenomena or designing solutions to problems. And we hope that those phenomena are compelling to all students because they wanted to figure out why something happens. 
that's the hook. Now, when students try to figure out the phenomenon, they can use any means of a communication to communicate. They can use the gestures, they can use the diagrams, they can use the home language, they can use any means. Over time, as the students become more understanding and have more to say and develop ideas, then they wanted to communicate. So proficiency in English, if you define proficiency as the beginning to pre-teach and precursor and it's a requirement, then you're starting from language. But if you start from science, students are doing science and they are using language. And over time, as they become, develop their understanding, they wanted to talk about it and language becomes a product because they wanted to talk about it and they have an understanding. So even in language, there is the approach that we all have need experience, meaning we need a prior knowledge, and then we have the idea that we wanted to talk about, and then we need a language to communicate ideas. So that's the idea. Ideas are first, something to talk about, and then I wanted to find out, and I wanted to communicate, but not the other way around. So cognitive ability is really a function of a student's developing an understanding to make sense of phenomena, and then communication happens over time, and language is a product. So if for nothing else, if you say thinking about, we don't pre-teach, we don't front load because Oki is limited, it's a deficit. Instead, Oki has a great ideas in science. She wants to find out why something happens. She uses any means of a communication, including hand gestures and even Korean. And then over time, I have something to contribute and then my ideas matter. And then I will gradually learn English and bingo, I have a very sophisticated idea that I can communicate. And I may still have a spelling, spelling questions and I may have a still grammatical errors, but, but I communicate and I will develop the ideas along with the language. So think of a language of proficiency as a product, not as a precursor. I hope that I respond to the question. All right, I'm going to move on and thank you so much, Scott. I said that please stay on for an hour and a half and so we are about, and I'm good. So I gave you the warning and please stay on. Are you okay? May I continue? I'm getting, yeah. thank you, Kathy. If anybody needs to leave, feel free. Like I said, this will be on uh, our website as a video, but anybody that wants to stay around, go ahead, please. Oh, please. This is really the fun part. So if you think the first part was fun, the second part is even better, stay on. All right, um, here our second approach that I would like to propose. So we talked about the different practices across content areas. This time, combining, integrating content areas, another way to think about it. So here is our uh, work at, at, in my team. So you can see that uh, I am a science educator working with applied linguists focusing on assessment. Guadalupe well, Vivaldi is applied a linguist and Helen Quinn is a theoretical physicist. So we work together and it takes multiple disciplines working together to figure, to figure out why does it happen? How can we make it work? Here is all the standards, all students, and it's a flip. Traditionally, scientists and teachers say that this is a science knowledge, canonical science knowledge that all students know. And this knowledge is typically written in texts. Students read about science. And this is sort of like a primary origin of a why literacy is such a bully. That if you cannot read, you cannot do science because that's the way it was done. You read about. So students are doing science, some students, but most students read about science because I have to know. I'm told. Some students may understand the science. Most students will say, science makes no sense to me. This time, contemporary, it's a complete flip. So all students are doing science and they wanted to find out why something happens, like a scientist. I wanted to solve a problem, like an engineer. So they are doing science like scientists and engineers. It's a complete flop. They will read along the way or they will write along the way, but they are not told 
what to learn about. And I will continue that even more uh, later on when we talk about the computer science. Okay. <clears throat> so contemporary views on science and language. Traditionally, students they have to know science content because I'm told the two don't. Contemporary, view, contemporary views, students make sense of phenomena, design solutions, and it is knowledge and news. So it's a, what science does, it is not what science is. The same thing about language. Traditionally, students learn about the vocabulary and grammar so that I can come to science. Instead, contemporary views is that students use a language to do something, like in learn science. It's a language, using language, it's a what language does. It's not what language is. It's a using, it's a functional use of a science and language. So here is a year long fifth grade science curriculum that we developed, the physical science of what happens to our garbage. The second is the ecosystem of how and why did a tiger salamander disappear? That is the ecosystem. And here is the earth science of why does it matter if I drink a tap water or a bottle of water? It's an earth science of uh, earth systems. And then here is life science, I mean space science of how to. So here is uh, garbage. And the garbage materials that decompose like a banana and apple go into ecosystem. The garbage of a plastic that does not go into earth science. I was having dinner with a family with a two fifth grade uh, uh, twins. And we said, when we have so much garbage, what are you going to do? Throw the garbage into space. I'm not kidding, it really was a real conversation, but it's anyway. So just keep in mind that here is a garbage and then plastic is going to earth science. Uh, this is one of the few units at the elementary level that has an NGS is a design badge, which I am very honored. So it is a publicly available. Um, here is a storyline of the garbage unit. Becomes more subject. So here is a garbage. What do we know about the garbage? Here's anchoring phenomenon, driving question. What happens to the garbage as a properties of matter? How do we smell the garbage? It's a particle nature matter. What causes the changes? It's a chemical reactions, a conservative matter, decomposers that goes into ecosystem. So these are all structure and properties of matter at fifth grade. Now, the first day of science instruction at fifth grade, students see mounds of the garbage in the center of the classroom and they think that's the coolest thing. Some students will say yikes and others will say cool. Well, we have a strong reactions and if nothing else, we got them. They are not bored, they, we got them. We got them, okay. But the, the first thing is that they are sorting garbage into categories and when you think about the sorting, you can see that sorting has some sort of a qualitative analysis. By sorting into categories, so they are looking into, so here is a plastic, food and non-food. We don't need to know biotic and abiotic. Food and non-food at fifth grade. And then of the food, there is a solid and liquid, and then there is a, and then, then a soft and hard. So there are, subcategories of the food. Non-food, there is a plastic and metal, hard plastic, soft plastic. So there, there are the categories, subcategories. So by looking into the, pat the categories, you're actually looking at patterns. You're already doing cross-cutting concepts. Now, when you do the, 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 the solid food and liquid food, you're looking at the subsystems and subsystems. Um, school garbage, home garbage, and neighborhood garbage, you're already looking at the subsystems of the whole garbage system that goes to a landfill. So without ever saying patterns or systems, students are already doing patterns by looking at the categories. Students are already doing systems by looking at these different categories or subcategories of, of garbage into landfill. So that's why science is so powerful because the understanding of the ideas occurs from the get-go, even when students may not use the language. 
here is it. So I, you cannot put the garbage in the room because you will have a bad smell. So you put the garbage into two jars. Now you can also see another way. Here is an open system. Close the system. That's a system again. It's a cross-cutting concept. Now you can see that there is uh, orange slices and banana slices. So there is a plastic spoon and here is an aluminum foil. So you can already see food and non-food soil. And students measure the weight of the two over about three weeks because that's about the conservation of the matter. And they weigh, and you can imagine that the weight goes down here, but weight is the same. They also look at the properties of the matter over time. So you can see that the, both the, the, the banana and orange gradually decompose or gradually disappear, but it disappears, they disappear more here, I mean more here than here or something. So they do the properties of matter, they look at the conservation of matter, and they see that it's a changing. So there is a, something is a changing, and they're looking at, hmm, it's a cause and effect of a, something is a change, causing the change in the bottles, open system and closed system. After some time, they weigh the, the close the bottle and it's the same. And then they make a prediction of what do you think will happen um, if we weigh this when the banana and orange completely have disappeared. And a student who is very articulate may say that orange and banana have, uh, have disappeared, that they have decomposed, that therefore the weight should be less. Sometimes you see condensation of water and another very smart kid may say that I see new substance because I see water droplets and the, it has condensed. It sounds so articulate and smart. I, I don't speak English, but I, I think that it's just the closed. So weight the same. All I have to say is a closed and weight the same. That's all I can think of. They weigh the weight of the closed system. Holy, the student who is so smart with the decomposing or condensing and all that, realize that, oops, weight stays the same. All I had to say was a closed and the weight same. My idea matter. And then there is a smell. They think it's the coolest thing. And then we find out, we could have stopped, but this is a, such a wonderful moment to do bundling of performance expectations. So we look into what is causing the change with the decomposition. So we go into the ecosystem by doing the microbes causing decomposition, which goes into the decomposition of the microbes and all that in the ecosystem. So what do we do? Science instructional shift. Phenomena and problem, that is the first one. Students are figuring out the phenomena and designing solutions to problems. Now students are doing science by blending these three things. And then they build an understanding over time to explain how banana disappears, but plastic does not disappear. What is causing banana to disappear? Or what is causing plastic not to disappear. So that's a coherent understanding. Now, language instructional shifts. We tend to think of a language as a vocabulary and grammar and sentence structures and sentence frames and word walls and all that. They are all effective for us in some ways. But we think of a language as a using language rather than following the structure or following the vocabulary or following that those are the terms. Instead, we think of a language as a using it. How? Modalities are different modes of a communication. Right now, am I talking? Yes. Am I using text? Yes. Common core ELA standards that think of only linguistic, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and conventions of a language. Come to science. Am I using drawing? Yes. Am I using symbol? Right here, arrow. Am I using table? Right here. Am I using gesture? Right here. I'm using all modes of a communication. I'm using multiple modalities. I'm doing more than talk and text the way Common Core ELA think of language. Okay, so I'm good. Register. You may not be familiar with the register, but this is what you do all the time as a science teachers. 
language teachers may be familiar with the registers, but you may say, I don't know what the registers look like in science or social studies or math. So register means that how we use a language for a particular purpose in a particular setting. So in a classroom setting, we typically think of a register as I'm using everyday language, I'm using very specialized language, or you can think of a discipline language, or you can think of an academic language, it's something very specialized. So when I joke, I may use everyday language, but when I use a specialized language, I am using very special. I don't use a science inquiry because a science inquiry is a previous generation. Instead, I use the science and engineering practices because I have to be very, very precise. So what is really important about the register, how to use a language for a particular purpose, is that we use a language for a precise meaning more than precise vocabulary. And I will say later, between precise meaning and precise vocabulary. Okay, interactions. I use a language differently depending on different interactions. When I talk to one-to-one, -to -one, I don't say the, 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 the particles and all that. I say, you know, those and that, because you know what I'm talking about. So I don't have to be formal. Now, when I do one to small, I have to be a little bit more explicit because you don't know what I'm talking about. When I do one too many, I have to be, I cannot say it, that. I have to say exactly the beaker, that, the water vapor. I have to be very explicit. Now, when you write, you have to be really explicit. That that's when you give a, a feedback on your science reports. You always just say, what do you mean it? Can you be more specific about they? You have to be explicit. Now, I find that every, every time I talk about interactions on a, at a zoo, on a, during a Zoom meeting, I always find it really fascinating. This time, I'm howl, I feel like I'm howling to the wild because I don't see your faces. So I'm just assuming that you're listening to me. But there is this me talking to the wild of unseen faces. Hello, everybody. So I'm interacting with you, and I hope that you're interacting with me actively. So explicitness is really, really important because it's a beyond the here and now. You say, what, what, what is it? What, what do you mean? So we are using language, using all modes of a modality by using everyday language and specialized to communicate precise meaning and interactions determine the way I use the language. Am I going to be very explicit? Am I going to say informally it that? So, I just said something about the, okay. So here is a science instructional shifts. Here are the language instructional shifts. I can use the symbols when I do the diagram. I use a specialized language when I do use interactions. This time, we are taking the science curriculum into one step further. And this is where I would like to just uh, think with you about the, the convergence of a science and computational thinking using modeling. So it's a science modeling, mathematical modeling, and computational modeling. This time, with my colleague at NYU, we are moving into people who actually own the domain, and I call them Wizard of Oz, who design the, the computational, the, 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 the environment, and then who study how children think about computational thinking and modeling. So I feel very fortunate. I don't know much about as much about the computational thinking, but I am learning even now. Okay. So science and engineering, that's a science and a computational thinking. The purpose is by combining science and computational thinking, we are looking at the convergence or the integration of the two. In addition to language that we have been working on so that that science and the computational thinking are available and accessible to all students, including English learners, at the fifth grade. Here is a style of Bonova. Some of you may not be familiar with some of these terms. It's a little bit like that 
when even technology people come to science. So we use a science engineering practice in cross-cutting concepts and they will say, well, what is that? Say so it's the same thing. They have their own terms in the discipline. Asian-based programming that uses a blocks-based programming environment to, to do. So this is a programming. I have no idea. When I hit my computer incorrectly, that's what I get on the right side of a programming. I don't need to know. All I need to know is to use my computer to do my work. Okay. But someone else is doing the programming so that I can use my computer. Here is a Salogo Nova. So you can imagine that all what I consider gibberish to me becomes a somewhat of English. So there is a world, that's the whole, the, the world, the environment, and everyone total. So while run toggle, set my color to red, forward, right by degrees. At least it is meaningful to me. So this programming is put into blocks, block, 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 block in a meaningful chunk. That's a block. Think of a scratch. Scratch is a block based. The programming is translated so that it's a usable. All right, so models in the garbage unit. All right, follow me, this gets it better. Um, according to the NGSS, the science instruction, we did a physical model, students made their jar, closed system and open system. They developed their diagrams of open system and closed system, and they explained how the particles of the smell escape and reach my nose so that I can smell, but it is a closed, so it's the particles are closed. But weight stays the same, but it weight changes, decreases. Well, what happens is that when you do the microbes, students learn that microbes are called the changes to banana and apple. They read about it and they see the argaplate microbes, but they don't, it cannot explain how. What do microbes do to make the change? Students they cannot see the causal mechanism of what microbes do because we don't see microbes. So this is where the computational model comes in to explain why and how. So this is how students are doing all the coding using blocks, blocks, blocks. On the screen, what I see, so this is what I consider all the programming on my computer screen and all I need to do is use the computer. So here is what the students see on the interface. And that's what they do. When they give a command, their command appears here. This is what it looks like. Computational model to explain decomposition caused by microbes, science. You can see that banana weight, weight of a banana gas, solid and gas together remain 500. And then it goes up, smell, it goes down, banana, and they become, so total weight stays the same. It's a solid, goes down, gas goes up, and it's a 500 units. So this is how students do it. They give a command. Imagine that students are giving the command to a robot. So imagine that you're giving a command to Alexa. Alexa, play Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 9. I'm giving command. So students are giving command. Here are microbes. This is my agent. My agent is carrying out my command. I'm the master. Can you see how powerful students feel that I'm the master giving a command to my agent? Microbes are in contact with a solid banana. And solid banana turns into gas. So when students do the agent, they say, huh, solid changes to gas. The, they should be the same material, property. It changes, but it's a close right here. So we should stay the same. So our teachers will say that this is really the first time that the idea of a conservation of weight and then the changes of a solid to gas seems so intuitive because students see it. All right, now so this is a science. The students are explaining, oh, so microbes are in touch with the solid, solid and then turn into gas. 
and weight stays the same, and it's a solid banana, gas banana, but that's the same banana. They don't disappear. All right, so here is the, then here is a banana has disappeared, decomposed. And here is a plastic bottle. It does not decompose. So in the next, in another unit, why does it matter if I drink tap water or bottled water, even though we can drink both types of water, but why does it matter? So we are linking that to ocean because students really care about animals. How can we solve the problem that plastic pollution from bottled water harms ocean animals? So students will pick their ocean animal and they deeply care about the ocean. We don't want the plastic to kill my animal in the ocean. So that's the design. And here is, all right, brace yourself. It's a little bit more complicated. So students are using the blocks to give a command. This is one example of engineering, solving the problem of plastic pollution. One example. So some students will say that we build a more fountain, fountain, water fountains. Others will say that we build, we, we pick up more. Uh, some few students will say we'll have a more police officers to control the people polluting pl plastic. This is one example. Social media campaign to get more students at their school to use a water fountain instead of plastic water bottles. So here is a total plastic bottle, and the idea is that how can you keep a plateau? Sounds like a coronavirus. How can you contain the virus so that we don't increase, don't spread more? So here is agent using blocks. One, two, three, four fountains. People, the yellow, my agent, use a plastic water bottles and pollute. But when people drink water from the fountains, there is a 25% instead of using plastic bottles. So it's engineering and they do the solution for the design, the problem of water plastic pollution, and they do multiple types to see what would be the best way to do so that I can keep plateau. And then, so there are plastic people, plastic and the converting, and there are three types of agent using blocks. And we were doing this just before school closed. So think about this, coronavirus pandemic. Schools are doing some type of remote digital. So students have their hands on the keyboard and looking at the screen. What our students just did of how to keep plastic pollution contained is the same as how the coronavirus spreads and how do we contain in Washington Post. And it just dawned on our team that our fifth grade students are ready, getting ready for the adult life but also the science and the future. The same idea of a plastic pollution, coronavirus is spreading. How do we contain the pollution? How do we contain the spread of the virus? The same idea. I hope that you feel very humbled that fifth grade students, including English language learners, are doing it. Actually, we have the evidence that English learners seem to be sometimes even more excited and more capable of doing computational thinking. They may not, they may struggle, but at least in this class, we have some students who are so ahead of their thinking. So we are thinking of how to do the modalities, registers, 
thinking about how agent is another modality, just like language modality and science modality. We are making the blocks easier so students can use the blocks instead of that uh, gibberish coding and programming. And then students interact with a computer screen very different from the way they interact with the people. So we have a different medium of a communication that all seem to align with. So we are trying to see how these language and computational thinking all are in service of making sense of a phenomenon and designing solutions. So science and we put science and engineering at the center and then language is used and computation is used in learning science. So questions are for you. We have a 25 minute, five minutes. I said I will end at one hour, an hour and 30 minutes. About a minute and a half, if you jot down your thoughts of what would you say about this approach of looking at the intersections of a science and language and computational thinking by looking at the affordances. Scott, are you ready? I'm ready. Kathy's excited in the comments. She wants to try it herself and she sees opportunities. Uh, Janine, yes, I will share the slides. Um, I need to make sure I have the most recent version from Oki. I don't Scott, know if I have the yes. version that I gave you even about 10 days ago did not have the coronavirus because the, the world yeah. is too fast right now. Yeah, so if you uh, share the new slides with me, I'll make sure those get on the website. Absolutely. Scott, do you have a couple of questions? I know there will be close. questions coming through yet. I just know personally, like I've already had a conversation with uh, Sarah Cooper about we already have a joint conference with math, but we don't talk to our ELA partners. And I really want to have our three agencies sit down and have this conversation, this broader conversation in Nebraska. And you know, this has really inspired me a lot to get that done. I see. I see small number of people who are jo who are joining, still joining. And I wanted to say thank you. I hope that our discussion gives you some thought for you to take action. Scott, I love your idea of putting all three conferences together. Are really thinking about how it could work. So um, Janine from Michigan is asking, what are some baby steps as we decide to take action? What are some of the first steps you'd suggest? So based on the first approach of seeing the, the discrepancies as well as the conversions, that will open up um, the discussion. What would it be, what would it be, um, Again, this is just a different approach of, I have always, okay, Janine, just stay with me. This is my, this will give you a sort of image of, all right, I'm responding in, a, in an image, which is another mode of a communication, multimodality, right, okay. Broadening participation, so I studied that. Um, and that this represents the, the lives of students that, And I'm a strong advocate of a take a seat at the table. Start the conversation. The reason why I'm a strong advocate is that even not only the conversions, but there are moments when I feel like had I not been there, I would not have learned from my colleagues. But at the same time, had I not been at the table, they would not, my colleagues would not have heard my ideas. Had I not been there, my voice would have been silent. So speak up. 
if you have a question, the chances are other people will have the same questions. We simply don't speak up. So that was my experience of uh, even five years ago when I saw some of these questions and I said, oh, not me, I don't know enough. I even do not know how to ask questions to, oh, I'm not the only one. People do not know. Well, why not me? Let me, let me jump into it and figure out to right now, this is what I'm insisting. It's me. It's all of us. I, I would like to share my ideas so that you take action and say, it is me. I know now. And I will share the PowerPoint in Word document so that you can play, do the animation and share as much as you can. And I also provide the publications and references so that you can say that this is not Oki's idea. It's actually all the publications and research that have been sharing and shared. So I'm giving you sort of like ammunition that it's not one person's or our thoughts. These are really have been percolating and circulating across the fields. So I would like to say thank you. And instead of saying warm regards, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, stay safe and healthy. I'm sure that you are saying that to me in New York City. Okay, stay and safe. Thank you, Okay. It was a fantastic session. Uh, for everybody who's still here, tomorrow we have a blow with Open Syed. Um, and we'll finish up with Kathy Rinfrew, who's sitting in on all of her sessions this week. So. Looking forward to a strong finish to this week. And thank you for those strong till the end. And I appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.